something about his turbulence. I'm avoiding something. Oh, it's still coming for us. What is it? Delivery fulfilled. Don't remember ordering anything. Ah, it's pulled to open. Pulled to open. Yes, and what do you do? Probably someone just bought out their mind smoking a boat. You're just making sounds now. Brilliant. Come on. What? We're going undercover. Tap top. And remember, if you want it, here come the drums. Hello and welcome to Pull to Open, an ongoing quest to watch all of Doctor Who, the television program in random order. I'm Pete Paschal. And I'm Chris Taylor. And that, that was the sound of drums with, with the special warbling bird solo. Uh, we, we do like to switch it up here with the sound of drums on pull to open. Yes. Insert applause, applause emoji. Um, so we are a couple of journalists, a couple of guys, a couple of random time adventurers who have been skipping around the doctor's timeline. And, uh, we skipping around with stones goodness, that we've we, been throwing. We have done <laughs> this. This may be our largest single skip, uh, from story to story ever. Like we, you know, yeah, going, going from almost the beginning to almost the end, uh, it it doesn't get much more random than that. But Pete, do you want to catch like, up? Uh, catch you're, up you're the giving me vibes of like New Earth with tenants <laughs> going like further than we've ever gone before. But no, right. we're not going to New Earth because we have just oh, yeah. been at previously on Pull to Open three stories ago. We were in the Tom Baker era. We were at the the uh for Adric's first episode in a little yes. tale called full circle all about evolution and marshmen and leaving doors open <laughs> indeed uh and then we closed the door on that episode uh and then went way back in time so far back in time that the battle of hastings had not yet happened and it could have gone either way frankly because there was a weirdo there a monk of some sort and he was gonna meddle in time that was of course the time meddler that's right with special visit to the location of the time meddler uh go back and watch that episode if you haven't seen it already we got some great location shoots yeah yeah the, there was good stuff man there's lots of video footage uh, we could have had more yeah. <laughs> on that one <laughs> we we should be very for our premium subscribers that we don't yeah. yet have they will they will get more content See if you can spot the monk's atomic cannon in the footage. <laughs> yes. um, but if you don't have time for that, you can jump forward a little bit and you can go to last week's episode, which was even further back in time, at least for the show, uh, because we went all the way back to the first season and the second historical in the Aztecs. That's right. A story of human life being wasted. Uh, by a couple of uh, officious bureaucrats in in a large organization, mm. uh, which uh, may may have been a foreshadowing of where we went next. I think you're really stretching with that randomizer connection, <laughs> but we'll talk about that later after we've dissected series eleven, episode seven. Kerblam! Exclamation point. Kerblam! Exclamation point. And we should, of course, note, first of all, we do now have a bingo on stories with exclamation points. That's it. We've done it. If there's are, only the one. There's only the one. <laughs> if you have come here listening, for you're listening out for, like, when are they going to do a story with a slammer, as we used to call it in the newspaper business, at the end of it, this is it. We're done. Just one and done. <laughs> We're done with yep. slammers. Though, if uh, you if you expand to the expanded canon with the audios yes. and the books, you you get a few more. I remember the first time I actually saw the book Byzantium, which has the exclamation mm. point at the end. I was like, <laughs> "What? What? Of it's... all the titles and words to put an exclamation point after? What? It, what? It does make it sound like a music musical version of the story, mm. Byzantium." Like at least the audio bang a bang boom. It's like okay, maybe it's called for. <laughs> you know, absolutely called for in that context. Yeah, yeah gotta be also careful include- though, when you when yeah. you use your slammers. Uh, yeah, and I I almost want wanted them to name this episode Kablamazon, but that might have been a little <laughs> a little more obvious than it already is. 
Yeah, yeah, a little on the nose. If if <laughs> the, the the season up to this point has already been very on the nose, I think it would have been a little too far. But folks, mm. before we say anything more about Kerblam, I want to tell you you can cut right to all that commentary, all of the compressed commentary of that uh, episode in series eleven. Uh, which we're going to get to in a bit. And all you have to do, of course, is look at the show notes in your podcast app. Just go right ahead. The time code is right there for where we start the Kerblam commentary. If you're on YouTube, just scroll down a bit from the video. It's in the notes there as well. It's very prominent. It's right after the description. But of course, you are not going to want to do that because coming right up, we have an all new Hemoji challenge where we quiz a unknown contestant as to <laughs> what a doctor who title is by giving them some emojis it's it's actually a doctor who title in emoji form someone's gonna guess it wow. we have no idea who can't wait to find out who that sucker is uh, <laughs> yeah we also uh, we also have results from our latest poll on what everybody here that is everybody listening thought of the time meddler in poll to open and we also have a youtube comment of the week and it, uh it's it's coming up, uh, talking coming about up. <laughs> talking about some good stuff about yeah. the uh, the time meddler and some interesting tidbits that people might not know. It's um, all coming up in the pulse loop, uh, that should tell which you. is where we talk about one of the best ways to show support for Pull to Open, which is of course to leave a review on the podcast app you're in. I know that you're in a podcast app. You're listening to us. It's uh, it's uh, a day where you're, you're probably doing other stuff while listening to us, maybe watching us. You can just go straight to that podcast app, leave us a five star review or other stars if you feel like it. I'm just saying five might be a good default. And uh, that does make the show visible to more listeners. We are steadily climbing up the rankings, the SEO rankings of Doctor Who podcasts. Uh, we do have the disadvantage of not having Doctor Who in our title. So that when someone searches for Doctor Who mm. on Spotify, etc., they're not necessarily going to come to us first. But you know, dear listener, they should come to us first. So you can help with a with a review. It makes the show more visible. It gets it higher up the rankings. Uh, um, you know what else you can do? You can kablam a friend. You can just send them a uh, a podcast in a in a box, an empty box with bubble wrap, and just a single piece of paper. And it just says "pull to open," and maybe it has our URL at the bottom. Uh, or no just popping, them. no popping, no popping, no popping. Do not pop any bubble wrap, people. It's a very important PSA here on PTO. Um, but yeah, share it with a friend and then they will get to see what hapless jerk gets to, uh, interpret the emoji that Peter's now just going to, uh, deliver and oh crap, it's me. <laughs> That's right, everyone. It is time for the Humoji challenge. Oh boy. Oh, Chris, <sighs> our reigning champion. Yes. Last week was Listen, which is, honestly, I said this at the time, I, I've been waiting for this. I've been waiting for someone to just do an ear, uh, something like that. Like, I, I've, I've had that first in my head. I've had it so strongly in my head that when we had Hide, I couldn't even remember that there was a story hide, because I was expecting Listen. But now that's over. Yeah. I feel like the easy ones are done. Uh, what you, done the, easy, the easy ones are done, my friend. <laughs> You've had some, some very short emojis. Listen was short. We did Family of Blood. We had Brain of Morbius. Unearthly we got all those pretty really quickly. Yeah, the, the Unearthly Child, the Earth, and then the Cross. Love that one. Really well, let me just good, say good that kick off the, codex. the Reign of Easy is over. And <laughs> you, you're, you, you got the double whammy this week, too, because you got TLDW later. That so. is a Doctor Who line, if ever I've heard one. That's got to be in a big finished script somewhere. <laughs> the Reign of Easy is over, Doctor. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, we got some. Uh, we got a we got a big brain teaser here this time. Okay. Um, right. Comes to us by way of Bob Gilby, friend of the pod. He gave us a whole bunch a while back, and we're getting through them. By the way, listener, um, we we always need to reload these every now and then, and we've shown recently, especially with the listen emoji challenge, that these aren't that hard to come up with. So. Mm. But we do need people to contribute. We do need to reload our Kumoji challenges 
every now and then. So putting it out there, just a call, drop us a line wherever you can find us on the internet, either on YouTube or one of the socials at pull to open, pull to open 63. Uh, you can just give us give us some emojis, give us some more of these challenges. All right, because and it will go, we should mention, it will go permanently in our codex, mm -hmm. uh, which will register you as the originator of that brilliant emoji. Uh, and yeah, okay, bring it on, I'm and ready. Yeah. Feeling so good. Bob's Feeling gonna good get this one. one. All right, my friend, here it is. It is eight emojis. Oh no. First emoji, crystal ball. Okay. Second emoji, uh, eye in a blue circle. Oh, so it's God. like an eye staring out of a crystal ball, kind of. Okay. Then Easter Island statue. Oh, God. Then Easter Island statue. <laughs> then Easter Island statue. <laughs> then <laughs> the big top, like a big top circus tent thingy. <laughs> Then a bus, and then a wolf's head. I think it's a wolf's head. Jiminy anyway, Christmas. That's, and that's it? Put this, no one can see this, but I, I'm going to put this in the chat feature of our Zedcaster oh, here, because that was dear a lot. God. And I know you kind of, you, it, it's a lot. I think you it's might a want to lot. review. So oh, check it all there. God, Everyone watching on YouTube can see the emojis down below here, but I know you can't, so I wanted to make sure you could. I mean, there's so much going on here. The circus makes me think of Terror of the Autons. Uh, and and the, the, mass, the, the Easter Island heads. I happen to just be watching The Impossible Astronaut this week, which mm. had mention of the uh, Easter Island heads being something that the Doctor and River were mixed up in. So, oh my god, the, but the crystal ball, the eye, the, uh, is, is it, and, and then the, I'm assuming it's a bad wolf at the end? It's, it can't be Tooth and Claw, it's, uh, is it a bad wolf reference? It is not. Oh, crap. I'm gonna give you a hint, it's okay, Old Who. Yes. Old Who, oh my god. I, then, then I may be lost here, is it the greatest show in the galaxy, is it... I want it's the greatest show in the world! Oh my god! Did you just get that? I yes. thought there was no way you'd get this. I haven't even seen it! <laughs> yeah, well, that's. I knew you hadn't seen it, so I was like, there's no way he's getting this. Like, he has no idea what the plot of this show is. But wh why did you guess Greatest Show in the Galaxy? What gave it away? I think that just the circus tent. The and like, circus if it's tent. Old Who and a circus tent, and it's not Terror of the Autons, what could it be? That was exactly that's kind of what quote unquote gave it away for me when Bob submitted this. I was like, because it is a lot of stuff and you're kind of not sure. But then the big top is like how many circus type stuff has happened in Doctor Who? And there's, yeah. you know, you, that really narrows it down. And Garrett, greatest show in the galaxy, like then everything sort of made sense. There's a werewolf in it. I, I shouldn't spoil it, but mm. then there's like the three yeah, throws. statues <laughs> make, make sense. There's a lot of things i like oh i get it all right so wow. I, I have just mentioned river i feel like this is spoilers right here <laughs> like i've never been <laughs> i've never been spoiled by the emoji game before <laughs> this one's a amazing. little spoiler -ish. i don't know if you, if you know what's going on um well well done even though it's a, <laughs> a little bit of a little bit of a fluke on that one it was it was actually it wasn't a fluke you actually kind of narrowed it down you were like all right it's got to you be know, one of these things so great job you know, you you got to take the the lesson of brainstorming. No no bad ideas, and there are mo no bad guesses in the Humoji challenge. I think that's that's the lesson that I've learned today. Nice. Well, thank you, Bob, uh, for that one. And like I said, please submit some more. Whether your name is Bob or isn't, feel free to drop us a line at Pull to Open sixty three on a whole bunch of networks, or Pull to Open on TikTok, or Pull to Open on Blue Sky. Oh, a hey. new one, everyone. We're Whoa. on Blue Sky. Go ahead. Talk to us there. We're open to uh, kind of corner the market on Doctor Who's discussion on Blue Sky because I don't know if there's a lot of uh, <laughs> Doctor Who podcasts on Blue Sky right now. So, yeah, yeah, that's all over on Blue Box, uh, another Twitter alternative. Um, no, Ooh. no, it, but that would be a good one, right? We're gonna have a Blue Box section of Blue Sky. But yes, yeah. we're also on Threads. We're we're on all the all the Twitter alternatives if their names are Threads and Blue Sky. 
And where are we that people might be able to listen to us, Chris? Oh my goodness, yes. We're, we're also on Spotify, uh, <laughs> which is an amazing way to interact with the show. Not only can you rate the show right there on your Spotify app, but also you can vote. Yes, that's right. Look at your Spotify screen right now. Look at the thing at the bottom. You, you see there's a poll. It's going to be a poll on uh, Kablam on how you would rate Kablam within the pull to open rating system, which uh, varies from the Viscount Banger, which is the best of the best, all the way down to the Ogron, which is irredeemably bad, uh, with an increasing number of ratings in between. And at the end of the podcast, you'll get our full explanation of the ratings, you'll get our votes, but that doesn't matter. What matters is your vote, dear listener. Add your vote to that poll. Uh, and the poll is open no matter when you're listening to this. We keep those polls open. Uh, if you're in the future, just go go back and rate all of the shows, all of the shows that we've covered. Do it. Uh, do it. Do it now. And we have some results. The, the polls have not closed, but here are the results so far for the Time Meddler, which, just to remind you, Pete gave it a Dalek, which is good. Mm -hmm. So, my camp banger. Uh, I said it is a hybrid of a Dalek and a Professor Hater, uh, mm. which means that it's not so good episode, but at least we learned something or they taught us something. And my goodness, listeners, you you are so pro Time Meddler yeah. that it's I almost want to go back and watch it again. Fifty percent of you have given it a Viscount banger. Yeah. Wow. So, the so this are kind of shaming us here. It's like, really? Can you not well, see the brilliance? <laughs> the space helmet for a cow. Space That's helmet right. for a cow. It's just a great line. Space helmet for wrong. a cow. Panda on a chair. It's sheer poetry. Um, and uh, yeah, but it, this sort of uh, brings to mind the fact that we were talking about its ranking in Doctor Who magazine, where it became, I think, the the, the second best. Hartnell story, right? In the latest yeah. poll, so we we have meddled in in your affection for the time meddler. It would seem by rating it anything less than a Viscount banger. Uh, yeah, thirty three percent fully agreed with you. Pete said it was a Dalek. Nobody said it was a Professor Hater. We have seventeen percent for fixed point in time, mm -hmm. uh, which I I can see. I was considering that rating myself. That. This notion that it cannot be rated because it was it was trying something so new. It was sort of the beginning of the pseudo historical phase right. of the show. Um, that that was definitely a consideration. But yeah, yeah, Viscount Banger, it is. You've overruled us. <laughs> Although I, I think I placed relatively well with the the good showing of the Dalek there. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's kind of either that, depending on. For most folks, I think that. That watch hard and all it's either it's either like one of the best or it's just really really good um like i said at the time i don't i think the fact that hartnell's absent for a whole episode yeah is it kind of undercuts what i think otherwise would have been a viscount banger also going there one of the you know the randomizer is very wise and we do not question the randomizer and i think one of the reasons it sort of took us to the aztecs right after is sort of showing yeah like a historical i wouldn't say necessarily done right but done with the full-on production values of what they could do at the time. Like all those amazing, the costumes alone in the Aztecs are just uh, so yeah. amazing. So, yeah, yeah. That, is, um, that is the adventure of our random adventure. We're going to talk about that some more this week. This The, the, the juxtaposition of, of different eras of the show. And it's as interesting as when it's within Hartnell, as in you know Time Meddler versus Aztecs, as Aztecs versus Kablam, as Hartnell versus mm. Whitaker. Um, so yeah, I I don't know. I maybe if we'd watched the show in order, we'd have a different feeling about the time. Metal I think level. we would have, yeah. yeah, because you don't get obviously a lot about the Doctor's origins deliberately for a long mm -hmm. time, and then this sort of comes out of nowhere, particularly in the cliffhanger in episode three. So if you're kind of doing it and trying to sort of empty your brain about Doctor Who canon, I can definitely see this happening like yeah. a uh, smack over the head effect as you emerge Indeed. from it. So. But speaking of the meddling monk, we, that's not all we have to say about the time meddler because people are talking about it on YouTube. That's right. We are, of course, at youtube.com slash pull to open. That is a great place, by the way, to leave your Humoji challenge title or just comment. And we have some great comments on YouTube every single week. And I'd love to read one out right now 
from one of our listeners named Nat Smith. Friend of the pod, Nat, comments, had some great comments on YouTube. And he tells us something interesting that I did not know, which Mm is, I'll just read his comment here. Fun fact, the monk was pitched to make his big return to the show in series nine. So that would have been Capaldi's uh, second season. That's right. And that plot was going to feature a younger version of the character who decides a fun way to mess around with history would be to introduce Rasputin to the Boney M song about him. Shenanigans happen and suddenly has to take the place of Rasputin, a.k.a. the Mad Monk, which is like, oh, OK. Yes. Now, as as Nat goes to point out, you know, it's not exact, but like that's ob- elements of that clearly survived all the way to the power of the doctor. It's interesting, which, yeah. isn't it? You, you want to see what that through line was. Uh, yeah, thank you for, for alerting us to that. I did actually mean to mention this during our Time Meddler podcast, but we, we got, you know, there's so many things to talk about there. Mm. But this was a pitch by Peter Harness to Stephen Moffat. Uh, it was co- It was going to be called How the Monk Got His Habit. Uh, I think that was just <laughs> going to be a working title. Um, and yeah, because it, it, it features uh, the young version of the month, month yes. apparently, right? Because it's, it's prior to the Time Meddler. And if if you're a fan of Matt Berry, who uh, is a British uh, comedic actor and musician who stars in What We Do in the Shadows, uh, among other things, uh, that was was that was Pete Harness's first pick. That would have been fantastic, uh, and it would have come right after the Zygon Invasion slash Inversion, which we've done. It would have been a one-parter, uh, and yeah, yeah, it would have really focused on uh, on Rasputin, which not only was featured, of course, in Power of the Doctor, but also at uh, the very end of the the last Black Mirror. Uh, there's a, a story called wonderful story called Demon Seventy Nine that really focuses on Boney M and, oh, and wow. Rasputin. So, so that song is uh, that's that song is having a comeback, and you you. It, it's such a wonderfully natural sort of Doctor Who-ish thought to have of like, what if you played that song to Rasputin? Um, and <laughs> what effect would that have? It's a wonderful metal. It seems perfect for the monk because the monk does like, we, we talked about this a little bit, like his, his plots are just sort of like, you know, what if the master, but just rubbish. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is definitely would have fitted that bill, right? Um, yeah. What if I the mean, master, but just selfies? Yeah. Like, he just wants to go back and get selfies. Like, yes. that's what it is. That really feels like a Moffat script, right? That actually feels like a, a, a Matt Smith era script of, like, a lot of quick cuts of a character going throughout history, getting selfies. Sounds almost like something the Matt Smith doctor himself would do, right? <laughs> if, if any incarnation was close to the meddling monk, it was Matt Smith. Um, so, you know, especially, so, again start of the impossible astronaut you see him doing that throughout history himself just tried to get bond's attention oh man i love the idea yes mm. doctors doctor is a fanboy for history that's for sure yeah. but um, if this had been produced you wouldn't have sasha de one uh, dancing around to rasputin in a rasputin beard so you know swings around about yeah stuff. count your blessings mm. nat thanks so much for the comment keep on commenting keep on listening uh and that goes for everybody listening all right, on TikTok, we have been taking a bit of a pause on our most popular social platform, but we uh, we have just started up again. I'm, I'm saying this so it becomes true in, in some future timeline. <laughs> um, so, uh, so follow us over there. Become one of the thousands and thousands of people following Just Pull to Open, No 63, on TikTok. Uh, go check it out. And cool. yeah, and then we're, we're pulled over 63 other places. We're on blue sky. We're good. I think, I think it's time, Pete. I think it's I time. I think it is time, sir. Oh God. For your second challenge of the day, uh, which of course is the beginning I? of our commentary on Kablam. And we begin every one of these with a little segment we like to call TLDW too long. Didn't watch too long. Doctor who where one of us, summarizes the plot of the story in record time and this week that is you sir yeah and you know what it's one of those situations where we haven't been doing new who for a while so we've been we've been letting our tldws grow long and languorous in Mm. the acres of time that you get when it's a 
a classic story. You get 30 seconds per episode. But of course, with New Who, you only get one minute. I only have one minute to summarize. One Kablam. minute. So, one minute will yeah. be over in the time of a, it takes to pop some bubble wrap, my friend. Oh, oh God. It'll be over in the time it takes to actually get an Amazon delivery. Um, uh. from, from it being ordered, which seems to be about where we're going with that. Uh, yeah, okay, all right. I, I'm, I've closed all my tabs. I, um, I'm going to assume that the Amazon package just out of view over there is not a spoiler, um, <laughs> but <laughs> it's closest, closest I've got to one. Um, all right. All right, well, if you're ready, we're yep. going to pick <clears throat> it, click it, and TLDW it. This nice. is the official pull-to-open summary of Kerblam! In three, two, one, go. The Doctor, Graham, Ryan, Yaz are traveling through space. Something's chasing them. No, it's a Kerblam man. It's, it's a postman who's got a fez for the Doctor and a little slip that says, help me. So they follow uh, the, the, the slip to this planet, where the moon of the planet where the, the Kerblam officers are. And they, they get jobs in there using the psychic paper. And, and they discover the people have been going missing. And uh, what's going on? It's, it's all very sinister. And they, they sort of try to talk to the human resources people about it. But nobody's really paying attention. But there's a... There's a there's a lovely girl called Kira, and there's there's a guy called Charlie who's maintenance and and uh, and uh, it turns out it's uh it's the the bubble wrap that's doing stuff and 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 Kira gets blown up by the rub- bubble wrap and and that's what's been happening and it turns out it's it's Charlie he's this kind of terrorist uh, who is actually uh, anti kablam and he's been uh, working against them all, the whole time. And the, the plot is that there's explosive within within the bubble wrap in the Kablam package. And, and Kablam! And Kablam, basically, <laughs> the end. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, yes. And You're all the robots blow up because they've been re- reprogrammed to deliver to themselves. Uh, and, and Charlie's among them, and he can't understand what's happened, and that's it. All right. Yes. There we go. <laughs> kind of a triple ending there. Um, well done. Well done. Thank almost you. had it. Almost had almost, it. Almost. Almost. I, yeah. I I realized once I was looking at the clock tick to forty something seconds. I did not give you the thirty second. Uh, I was waiting which, for that. <laughs> yeah. I did, so I I I'll take some responsibility for you going over by a few seconds. So but, apologies for that. But yeah, then we I was wouldn't derelict have had in my duty perfect. as the timekeeper. We wouldn't have had that perfect ending there where I got to, you know, and the bubble wrap is explosive and, and then you said kablam and that just, yes, perfect. <laughs> no notes. Uh, <laughs> all right, How we're done. That's it. it. That's kablam. Come back next week, folks. It's uh, about <laughs> all we're we have to, to say. Randomizer. Let's fire up the randomizer. No. Okay. I guess we have to talk about this, don't we? Um, yes, we well, have to talk about it. Yes. yes. Okay, first of all, did, did, did I leave anything out of the TLDW that, that you think is significant? Significant uh, story-wise? I think, no. I think you, you, you kind of mostly mostly had it. Um, there, there's a little bit maybe with the head of people that I would right. have spent a little more time on. Uh, right. Judy. I feel like Judy, Judy. is sort of the um, hidden star of this uh of this story. She steals a lot of scenes. She's really, really great. Um, but no, I think, I think plot wise, it, it's, it's good in that it's, it's a good classic doctor who mystery plot and it's got twists and it's got misleads and it's got good dialogue knitting it all together. Um, I think one of the best things this does, it actually gives the regular cast always a challenge in this area. Uh, the, sorry, this era, because it's so mm. big, it gives them all sort of something to do and, and sort of an even amount of decent lines or decent moments. So huge points for that. Um, but I also think like there's there's a lot of like I feel like her bomb's a bit of a Rorschach test yes. for who you what, you know, essentially what kind of fan you are, what what, what your politics are. Like it's not just it's not just the poli- obvious political dilemma here, or you could argue mislead of sort of it seems to be taking a similar stance, uh, an anti-capitalist stance similar to oxygen. Right. But then it, it sort of subverts that in the final act mm. by flipping everything 
uh, not quite flipping it all the way, but it just it basically if you thought that was going to be the point and your politics aligned with that point, you were probably disappointed that and you probably think it sort of muddied the waters or something or yeah. wasn't didn't have the gumption to go through with it. But I actually think it was it was intentionally making different points. And um I, I kind of don't mind that. I, I like the subversion of expectations on like yeah. what the show had to say, because we've seen this, like I, I, you know, oxygen wasn't that long ago at this right. point. Right. It was really just the last season with bill. Right. So, you yeah. know, you, you don't want to keep saying that thing that, you know, capitalism bad, which frankly is a bit of a, a bit of a lazy message. And weren't we told uh, at the end of oxygen that, that the, the events of oxygen basically wipe out capitalism for good in the galaxy. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I guess this is before that. Uh, yeah, you're right. It's a Rorschach test, and um, I'm actually kind of glad of that because we've we've had many cozy pull to opens where where you and I, Pete, have have a roughly similar take on a story. You know, there, there'll be a little variation at the edge, but I did not like this at all. Oh my. Uh, and well. it is, yeah, we're, we're going to get into this. Oh, we're going to uh, get into it. Hold on. I got some Where's things to say. In emoji. <laughs> I got some things okay. to say. You go. This point. I talked for a bit. You go. Tell me okay. why you didn't like this. So, first of all, I got to say that, you know, mostly in the pull to open journey, especially with New Who, we do find that things are, are better on a rewatch. I was assuming that's what was going to happen here. But no, it was kind of the same problem that we had with the Saranga conundrum, which precedes this chronologically, uh, in that there are just too many questions, too many little bits of fan service that don't actually mean anything. And I just, I, I wasn't, I didn't buy almost any of the characters um, and I, I thought the message was not only muddy, it just didn't make sense within its own rules. So, huh. but, yeah, let me tell you why you're wrong <laughs> on all of those points. <laughs> but before I do, I'll let you expand a bit. <laughs> all right. Well, let, let's just start. Let's just start with the opening. And actually, before we even get to that, let me just say like that the, the, the references that the callbacks felt much more to me, like we were in like arc of infinity, Right. Remember mm-hmm. when we were talking about like just the, uh, for, for some reason they mentioned the temporal state of grace. For some reason they mentioned this. Like it, it just, uh, it was that era of the show where everything felt shoehorned in. And, and the ultimate example of that is, you know, Yaz is like, says the doctor, I bet you were the sort of kid who just poked wasps nests. And, and the doctor takes that as a talking of wasps. She literally says, "Did I ever tell you about that time about me, me and Agatha Christie?" I wish that the one, fans were like I, unicorn on the wasp. I'll give yeah. you that. That's that's a bit meaningless, but I do mm-hmm. like it. It's to me like I think they the, that and the earlier one with the fez do yes. have meaning. This has less meaning. This is more like they're about to sit in a cupboard for an hour or two and they need to pass the time. So why not just tell them the story about what she met as Agatha Christie? I really don't think it's much, anything more to be taken from that. And, well, it, the- and it is like one of those <laughs> things. It's like, Oh yeah. Like did, you, if you want some reassurances, it's the same show. It's the same show. But the earlier one with the Fez, yeah. I liked for other, for reasons. One, it's funny. It's actually a, a good gag, but also that I think that's the thing that's setting you up for more of a traditional doctor who, episode here right and uh, so in other words i think earlier in this season frankly the storytelling was pretty straightforward i mean we talked about this with rosa and this is another one where you and i sort of had different opinions where i thought it was just mm-hmm. too on the nose too much of an after school special despite the weighty um subject matter and i felt like that was sort of a symptom of a lot of what er- earlier in, in in this season they were it was just very straightforward it was very linear mm-hmm. storytelling and this is like okay we're gonna do something a little little not different and crazy, but it's like a little more traditional. There's going to be misleads. There's going to be plot. It's going to be kind of a whodunit and a mystery, which of course is not at all new to Doctor Who. But I mean, it's been doing this kind of thing um, forever, and it's like we're gonna we're gonna we're doing that, you know, which yeah. I think is is okay. Okay, so so I have some questions. These these are not the four questions of Doomsday. We'll get to those. <laughs> uh, one of them was, how does Kablam know that the Doctor likes fezzes? 
Uh, no, okay, fine. Oh, I, I can roll with that. I got I lots of that. headcanon to, to throw at this one. <laughs> but I think perhaps more importantly from that scene, and I think that the opening scene is, is the cause of a lot of my problems here. Why, first of all, why would Kablam set up their delivery drones so that they look like a threat chasing you? Like, oh, how, how would like that... for sensors? Yeah, the, the, uh, that, the yeah. TARDIS is like escaping this threat, and then it turns out to be the Kablamla. Now, I understand from from a sort of action yeah. movie point of view why you have to do that, but but yeah, why why does uh, it's it's like as if Amazon set it up so that the the van that delivers your package was like really scary, and the guy's wearing a Frankenstein mask, and like it just it, the, the fact that it looks like a threat, and then the robot to me, the the delivery robots and the robots throughout this look scary as hell. So like, but to an unbelievable point, like why would the company make this the face uh, of their cup? Why would they think that that was a good idea? And and also. Following on from the Sarango hmm. conundrum, we have the same question of how do teleports work? <laughs> I, uh, you know, is it just short range thing? Like the Kablam man gets close and the, and then he teleports into the TARDIS. Like, is is that a th- I just had so yeah. I'm, many I will ad- totally admit you have to bring a, a certain amount of headcanon to sort of yeah. explain away any of this stuff, and it's not all going to work. So the the threat thing I can't really explain, although I could give it a good try. So here's the thing, I le- what I think really explains a lot of the TARDIS stuff um, and the teleportation stuff uh, with regard to getting in the TARDIS is that the doctor's clearly a fan of Kerblam. She's like almost like a fangirl, and she's like, oh, I love the Kerblam man. Like, clearly the dog, like if you use the Amazon analogy, clearly she has a Kerblam account. <laughs> and she's probably so enamored with this experience or the man or the company or whatever that she's essentially, you remember when Amazon a few years back was like, we can deliver right to the trunk of your car and we can deliver to your garage. And, and then mm. these sort of like, you can even have like cat flap type stuff for just mm. the Amazon person. Mm-hmm. Like essentially the doctor set that up, you know, in the TARDIS, which is like, okay. Right. Like otherwise it's like, how could the thing could even get in the TARDIS? Right. Which uh, admittedly this happens, seems to happen a lot, but in particular to Whitaker come to think of it. Like if you think <laughs> back to orphan 55, which again, that wasn't an invader, but like transporting yeah. in and out of the TARDIS was a thing. Yeah. You know, like, but so, so what I, what I, my headcanon is that she's this super fan that basically has either opted in for the, the cat flap, essentially <laughs> the, the delivery person can open your door right. or she's hacked her own version of it. Right. Cause she's, she's in a TARDIS and she's like, Oh, I'll, I'll just have to set something up so that her bland man can come right to the console room whenever I order something. Right. Cause she seems totally not surprised once she realizes it's the Kablam man. It's like, Oh great. Yeah, of course. Right. This is just yeah. this thing. And as you say, she says, I love the Kablam man. And to which my question was why? <laughs> why why what's lovable what's not creepy like the the doc yes i know that some of the doctor's best friends are robots but some of her worst enemies have been robots too uh like you why would you be so so unsuspicious of this of this character just coming the, in the tardis like okay i get i get that there may be reasons why the doctor would be a kablam fan why she would love the kablam man but tell us like you know if you're going to retroactively insert if you're going to insert like unicorn and the wasp references you can certainly sort of retroactively reference past adventures where she got kablam deliveries right or you know she got like maybe Eh. there's some adventure where she saved humanity because she got a kablam delivery in the nick of time you know i just needed something to get me over that sense of like wait we were in threat to the tardis mode you know right like we need a little bit more to get us past that I think. Yeah, I, I, I do think it's a great idea that it's maybe in some future episode she does some kerblam order that yes. retroactively get, does sort of the Bill and Ted thing and arrives the day yes. before or something. You know, like <laughs> so she just get, gets a thing like that way. That would be kind of really really clever. It, it could um, almost be our new what, where is the Clara Splinter? <laughs> it's like where's the, uh, where's the kerblam delivery? <laughs> so on the design of the robots, I do disagree. Mm. I do think they th- threaded a de- decently threaded a needle of having something that's kind of like cheerful and fun, but also believably creepy in the mm. right context. And I think the thing that probably doesn't quite work is, is more of a production design thing of like, they have the glowing eyes and a yeah. lot of the scenes are poorly lit. Right. And mm. that's intentional. That makes them seem way creepier 
when they're yep. just these glowing eyes sort of down the aisle from you. But I do like the whole, like, I'm a smiling guy and I've got sort of an official looking uniform. And, you know, I can kind of see that. It's like, um, yeah, I don't know. It's like it's like the guy at the I, I God, I'm going to butcher this, but there's always usually some ringmaster, not quite ringmaster type, but the guy in the red outfit at the circus who has oh, a yeah. cap and I, what do you yeah. call that? He's like the trumpeter. Yeah. I don't know. I but think like, I think it, ringmaster is, is good enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So I can leave aside that. I'm, I'm just talk, I'm kind of talking us through the, the things that popped up in my head to stop me as I was watching this. Uh, next thing, they go straight to Kablam HQ. They they talk straight to, to Judy, right? She, who, mm-hmm. for yeah, some head reason, of people. Is at the, she's the head of people, but somehow she's at the front desk greeting people. And the, well, the doctor's yeah. trick with the psychic paper is to say that they're friends of the first lady. Now, uh, yes, the doctor didn't know, and that's sort of the, the joke about psychic paper. But like, does Judy not wonder why friends of the first lady would be working working a crappy job in a warehouse? Like, what? why would they want to do that? What's What's the point of that? It just, right. again... Yeah, actually, that, that kind of almost it. went by me. The first lady, honestly, mm. it almost didn't matter what it was on the psychic paper. I will say that is probably one of the gags that just doesn't work, even if it's a gag. It seems like yeah. it's just lazy writing. Let's just fill in something, and this is the first thing that popped into their heads, yeah. and they, there, there was no opportunity to either make a reference or do something even more clever. So, yeah, that right. definitely also, needed a little like, bit of work, but I, it didn't First didn't lady, bother First me lady of what? Like at least, yeah. Well, that's the other thing, right? (laughs) uh, Presumably, this is. Well, it it seems like. I mean, if you look at the scale of this thing, this it seems like Kerblam is the big galactic delivery service, and they seem to have this instantaneous teleport to virtually anywhere in that galaxy. Yeah. Right. So this is like Type Three civilization level Earth Empire. Like this is pretty far future. I think you know if you look at. The Bad Wolf era stuff, like which was, I think, supposed to be half a million years in the future or something like mm. that, like five hundred thousand years. Like it's probably beyond that even. Right. So yeah, we yeah. don't get any sense of location in space or time, as you say. They have instantaneous teleport, so mm. just as they did with the Taranga Kandra, but they can go anywhere in the universe. Like, what's up with that? And then, if that's the case, why well, is galaxy. it facing the Doctor in the let's galaxy? Be, let's strive yes. to be accurate. Yes. Where classic series was not. Sorry, um. the, the galaxy, <laughs> this galaxy. They they do say that. You're absolutely right. Uh, but yeah, Judy has this other line where she says, uh, "Build a warehouse on the moon. It's never going to be perfect." Why? What? Wh- okay, so then why build a warehouse on the moon? First of all, uh, secondly, why putting it on a moon makes it not perfect? I don't understand. Well, I think our just I main just point is nothing's ever going to be perfect. Um, so as, as we were talking about the teleport, though, I, I this is kind of one of the problems I have with a lot of sci-fi. I don't think it's a serious problem in this one, in that to the the idea that of teleporting anywhere in a galaxy is such powerful technology on its own yeah you you sort of wonder like why is anything even a problem in in this level right you get into sort of very sort of isaac asimov type sci-fi once you even sort of entertain that possibility so the thing i have to sort of zero in again this is a headcanon but it's like the the teleporting is is either is so power restrictive or so power intensive or um, you know, particularly at the end, they, they, uh, Charlie has to keep a bunch of those Kerblam delivery bots there mm. mm-hmm. to do his thing. He can't just, you know, uh, conjure them up on a whim, you know, he, and so in other words, like that, that teleporting energy is something that you is so rare. It's either rare or they need so much of it that he, you, you can't just, uh, just, just ha- just do it. Right. So that that to me suggests that they couldn't just easily access some teleport ability, even though they do Mm. sort of at the end when they activate the teleport to get down to the uh, where is it? The delivery spot? Right. Yeah. Packing? No, it's not packing. It's like they're down at the original level or something like that where where Kablam started. Well, it's where where the deliveries all go out. So all the packages get down there on the conveyor belt. But no humans are allowed access down there. 
because presumably suits to not interfere with the deliveries. Uh, but again, I, I, I find that design incomprehensible. <laughs> like, why would you design a, a part of a, 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 any installation to be not human accessible? Like, surely, even if it's not, they're not supposed to interfere, you'd want, in the event of an emergency like this one, to be able to actually go down and check things for yourself. I mean, yeah, yeah. That, that, that didn't quite work for me. And and all of these that are, are problems that could have been solved with a little more dialogue, right? I mean, and and I know, and I want to give a shout out to to Pete McTie, who wrote this. He also wrote Praxis, which I haven't seen. It's one of the few Whitakers I haven't seen. Oh wow! Uh, and or co-wrote Praxis, and um, yeah, you know, and he, he also pretty- writes a lot of the Doctor Who the collection promos. So mm. he gets a, it's a pretty good gig for uh, Pete McDie. He yeah. did uh, a whole number of them, including the one that I was raving about just a few podcasts ago, which is called The Passenger. Oh, yeah. And that's the thing where Tegan, mm-hmm. uh, I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen yeah. it, but it, it stars Janet Fielding and Sarah Sutton. And it's right. for the upcoming season 20 box set. If you haven't it's- seen it, Definitely yeah. check it out on the YouTubes. Yeah, the um, Tegan Nissa reunion. Definitely check that out if if uh, if you know those characters. But it, um, it, it to me, yeah. like just to get a little more on Peak and Kai, I think mm-hmm. it his th- this shows sort of where his strengths are, right? Which is to say, he takes a Doctor Who, he gets Doctor Who, but he mm-hmm. also knows how to tweak it and subvert it in some key ways, and I think he does a great job of that here. Which to me is why Kerbalam succeeds. Um, like you take sort of a, a Doctor Who type formula and and really just makes it sort of twisty and turny, not just in a plot sort of way, but in a theme sort of way. And I think I think it really comes together here in Kerblam. I mean, he he does like I, I want to give him a shout out for some of the dialogue. There, there's some nice witty lines in this. Uh, I liked uh, uh, where they they do medical scans on on the TARDIS team as they are. Uh, inserted into the warehouse operations. And uh, she notes that the Doctor has two hearts. Um, and uh, the, the Doctor has this great line, two hearts, courtesy of the First Lady, very good health care, don't want to talk about it. Um, <laughs> which I love. Like, And that is the level of explanation that, that you need to sort of like get over the the questions that, are, that may be occurring, right? And it just, the, the only problem is that you don't get that more. And for me, there were just so many of these like you know, it starts off with my my questions about the delivery in the TARDIS, and it and it continues with my questions about them just sort of so easily inserting themselves into the warehouse operations if they're well, friends of the first lady, and then it continues see, with like yeah. the break room is this beautiful park, right? And I'm like, why why wouldn't cool. everyone just want to hang out in the break room again it just sort of feels like it needs a line to get me over the fact that like it's so different from the rest of the warehouse. Couldn't they make the rest of the warehouse a bit nicer? I don't know, you know? Um, and, and then all the way to the end, I'll just get this one out. I do not understand how putting explosive gases in bubble wrap is supposed to work. Like, there's no no explanation well, I mean, that, for that. I don't get that's it. That's not too hard. So here's the thing. Like, what you're sort of seeing, looking for sort of explanations on things, I think mm-hmm. Pete McTie is, is wisely thinking either fans or, or even if you're not a van, you you can you can head cannon enough of this stuff that you'll you'll you can it, it just work you can make a way to make it work. Or you're probably not asking the question because you're just more of a casual fan. And so, like, right. yeah, I think he he actually kind of knows what to leave out. So I don't think you really need much there. I, and would would it have helped much to say that like, oh, this is you know, Venusian gas that once it encounters oxygen becomes explosive. Yes. It, <laughs> <laughs> for me, anyway. Okay, fine. I mean, for, for me, like, it's like popping the bubble wrap sets off the explosion, and I think that's that's completely fine. Um, I get it. Uh, sure, you could throw in another line. I don't think you need to. Um, but I will, I totally agree that the, a lot of the dialogue really works, and a good chunk of it um, is from Jodie Whittaker. I think mm. be, beyond just some of her gags, which I think are some of the better ones of her run, I really, really like the conversation that she has with Slade when he is rude to Kira. And because she is very doctorish there, and mm. but 
but it, I think she's very 13th doctor ish. Like she, she, this is one of, I think a very good definitive scene for Jodie Whittaker's doctor where she can sort of gently dress him down, but also show him, uh, the, the fact that she's doing it gently, you know, I think is a huge thing here. Like it's contrast that with full circle, which we were at recently mm, and Tom Baker's yeah. indignation at the deciders, right? Which is great. Don't get me wrong. That's one of the best scenes of full circle, but this is very emblematic of Jody's doctor and getting him to sort of, uh, think about what, what a true manager is and turning that scene around on him, not in a, like I'm better than you a well, sort of, but in the sense of like, now you have something to prove to me. And, right. and even though she doesn't completely unmask herself there, as like the doctor and the person that's going to solve all the problems here. I thought it was very, very good. Wow. We, 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 we are just going to disagree on everything this week because I, I thought that scene was a bit like, I thought the confrontation was a bit needless. Like, yes, uh, Slade comes in and he's bullying Kira and then Ryan steps in. And the doctor's like, no, I'm going to step in. Uh, but I feel like you get more out of Slade just by buttering him up a bit more. And I, I felt like, uh, this was not not a good example of, of the Doctor doing that. But yeah, you're right. You know, contrast it with like a Tom Baker coming in and being shouty at the deciders. I guess it's I guess it's okay. I, I really do want to be careful because you know what else I watched this week was uh, the the wonderful uh, Community uh, parody. If you, I don't know if you've seen Community, the uh, the the, the I've sitcom seen Community, yeah. and sure. the the par- the Doctor Who parody therein, Inspector Space Time. Oh wow! I haven't seen that one. Oh my goodness! Go go check yeah. out the Inspector Space Time episodes. I've casual kind of community. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I don't bring a lot of headcat into it. So you got to go see the one where they go to the Doctor Who. I mean, the Inspector Space Time convention, and we learned <laughs> that there was a female Inspector Space Time called Inspector Minerva. And everyone dislikes oh, wow. her, but it's not because she's a woman. It's just because the episodes were bad. Like they, they, they definitely <laughs> skewed that. And this was before this was before Jodie's run. So like it, it definitely skewing sort of this unconscious sexism and bias and all of that in fandom. So I want to be very, very careful. Very, very careful that I'm not doing uh, uh, a she's such a Minerva here, which is basically how they <laughs> how they sort of how no these male fans that. keep saying it. Good, good, but you know, uh, but like I'm thinking that is Nick is this an example of that? Because like I liked Tom Baker going in and yelling at the deciders in full circle, but I didn't yeah, I mean like you can like both. That That's okay. Approach this, um, but anyway, okay. Th- that said, I think that there's there's a bigger problem here with the the question of who's in charge. And we were just okay. at the Aztecs, uh, where we one we, one of the things we were talking about was how masterful it is that John Lucarotti doesn't make you think about like, well, hang on, who's in charge here? Where's the Emperor? Where's Montezuma? Mm-hmm. Uh, we just get the two priests, and that feels like enough. Now here's a situation where we just see two executives in Kablam, right? right? We see Judy Maddox, and we see Slade. And and that's supposed to stand in. And for me, this time it did not. It was the exact opposite end of like I was immediately like the question of who's in charge of Kablam? What right. kind of company is this? Where is Space Jeff Bezos? Well, and they even say at one point there's ten thousand workers here. Yeah, and really, and there's only basically two two people <laughs> in senior management. Yeah, uh, that seems a little off. I mean, it's uh, you know, again, you could headcanon it a bit. I mean, yeah. and I, I don't feel the need to because I, I could sort of make up something along the lines of, well, it's a warehouse. You don't really need a lot of management per se, and most of the human jobs are could be done by robots anyway. So they they don't I, re- need I much like management that. other than the robots themselves. Yeah, it doesn't feel like it would take much much extra to sort of make this feel a bit more satisfying for me. Uh, because I especially like the the way that Judy is kind of uh, she's gone native, as she says. She starts talking about organics uh, right, instead of yeah. people, and that that yeah, really great, great writing. Yeah, yeah, that that sort of sense of like you know, oh yeah, you you would have a bit of sort of Stockholm syndrome in this kind of situation. Like, and and we do see that in the world of work today. Uh, people sort of 
uh, genuflecting towards technology, well, right? And you're getting at why I think Kerblam, again, I mean, we are at opposite ends of this, whereas I, I liked it the first time it came out and I liked it even more this time because I do think it does speak to the world of today. It, it did, like, I mean, it wasn't that long ago it came, it was 2018, but I think it's even more prescient today mm. in the world of AI and chat GPT where not just warehouse workers are scared of losing their jobs to machines, but everybody is, even people like you and me. Yeah. So that that message really, really um, uh, resonates. For and, sure. Yeah. 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 We so, we can talk about let's let's talk about that. Let's zero in on that because I want to talk about bullshit jobs, uh, <laughs> which is not just a description but also the title of a book by uh, David Graeber, who was uh, an academic and provocateur. He was the guy who came up with uh, the phrase "the ninety nine percent" during Occupy Wall Street. Uh, you know, he yeah. also wrote a great book called Debt, The First 5,000 Years uh, and The Dawn of Humanity, which is sort of very uh, politically left-leaning look at the majority of, of prehistory, uh, right, in the way that we lived then. Um, and he came up with this book called Bullshit Jobs, right, which is this concept that, that, that capitalism is just going to have to come up with bullshit jobs for us, which is kind mm. of what they're saying here, right? It's like, okay, we can automate this whole thing, but you get 10% humans if you really must. Now, this the pro, may, maybe I'm just yeah. too close to the subject because I've written about it a lot. I've written about universal basic income as a, as a solution for this, right? Mm, but right. also, one word, unions. I mean, mm. we, we learned that there were labor protests on this planet, on this, this home planet of Kablam, and uh, that that was what brought in the 10% law. Now, I can sort of believe that, that that's like a you know, really crappy political solution to, oh, yeah, oh, we'll, we'll just give you yeah. 10% of the, you know, like, we'll just mandate this thing, it'll be fine. I can buy that. It just sort of needs a bit more. Like, wh why are the people, A, not unionized uh, in the first place, B, not pushing for a new universal basic income solution? Because you get the sense that they want to work in this warehouse. And as I noted, right. other than the break room, it's a really horrible place to work. Why would you not well, just want here, universal basic income? Start here's your own where company. I'm kind of agreeing with you. Like on most of the plot stuff, I don't really care that they didn't have those extra lines and stuff. But on this mm -hmm. part, I, I I do tend to agree with you that I would have liked a, a slightly richer picture of this society and how it works. Because there's a lot of allusions made to work being something that is a bit rarefied here in this society now. Like you're the Basically, there's some lines about they're lucky to even have a job, implying that the majority of people don't in yep. this society, that they just, then what do they do? Well, that's never explained. Is exactly. there a universal basic income? Maybe there is. But, I, I, and I don't want to bring headcan into this because I think it's an it, it's something the show itself should be saying. Exactly. I can bring headcan into it in that it's like, it is it saying something along the lines of, um, People want, and I, th I would tend to agree with this. People want to work. They want to be useful. Mm. Uh, for, put aside financial needs. Assume that's taken care of. Uh, people still need some kind of purpose in life and some way to fill their time that contributes to society in mm. some way, right? And if you, if you simply have machines that can literally do all of that better than a human could, whatever it may be, do we lose something of ourselves, right? Mm. Um, it's a bit getting sort of high and mighty on the philosophical podium there to sort of say something like that. But I think it doesn't really even try this, yeah. this script. It's more into sort of the mystery and the subversion of the politics, but doesn't quite come out and say a thing that um, would, would maybe be something that this could, this episode would be better known for. Instead, yeah. I think it is better known for that Rorschach test this because it doesn't right now then we come in with our politics and either like it or don't sort of more based on that than then but there's really not a lot here that's said um yeah. so that's that's ultimately why i think Ver Ker <laughs> i shouldn't shouldn't spoil my rating <laughs> ultimately why i don't think it's not one of the best of the best but it is it's it's still very very good in all the things i said it does in terms mm. of the plotting the misleading and having fun while it's doing that yeah i mean you, you you bring up a great point about like the dignity of work and wanting to work and, and how much that matters and you're absolutely right and that does put me in mind of uh the wonderful 
uh, Nomadland. You, you may have seen the movie or read the book uh, by my uh, wonderful former colleague, Jessica Bruder, good friend. But uh, a lot of that is about, you know, like I, I was, uh, you know, uh, talking to her when she was doing a lot of this reporting. Like the, the people who do camper vans uh, and just sort of seasonal Amazon work in, in warehouses, like these older people who can't afford to retire because their social security isn't enough, but they live in vans. Like they've actually got a good life, you know, that there, mm. there is. Uh, they are getting their dignity of work and then they're, they're sort of, you know, they're living on the road as nomads and loving it. And, you know, they, they, they really, well, their message in the book was like, don't, don't cry for us. Like, even though we're doing this, you know, uh, cheap Amazon, uh, seasonal labor, we're still, we're still perfectly happy. So there's definitely something to that. Um, uh, but it, it just, yeah, I, I do want this question of like, why, why not have, why could the, the Lee Mack character, by the way, Lee Mack, British comedian, woefully underused as Dan, and the name mm. Dan woefully overused <laughs> in the Chris Chibnall era. Like, could you not have come up with a different companion? Well, un- underused but memorable. Mm. I will give yeah. a lot of points to all the guest cast, and particularly Lee Mack, who I think has mm. the least screen time of all the guest cast, but he, he, you remember him, not just because he's on a poster. He's, he's very, very good. His dialogue with Yaz is great. You really get a sense of connection there and believably... Uh, yeah, Yaz sort of gets attached to him, and then that sort of gets a lot of the plot going when he disappears. So, right, uh, and huge credit to Lee Mack and, and the economy of the script. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, he's 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 a good. I I love Lee Mack as a comedian who sort of emblem uh, very emblematic of of Britain and British attitudes. Uh, hmm. It hasn't necessarily succeeded internationally because of that, but you definitely see that that sort of uh, self deprecating humor on full display. And he likes Yaz because she laughs at his jokes. Uh, but then we're like supposed to remember that he had this little locket thing where he loved his daughter and he loved being a dad. Right. And she wants to deliver it at the end. We're like, oh, yeah, that was a thing that he showed her briefly half an hour ago. <laughs> like, yeah, but it's still, it yeah. still tugs at your heart a bit. You know, I mean, it's supposed yeah. to. And that's I, I'm OK with that. You know, it was, it, it was fine. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm just too wrapped up in the world of universal basic income as a solution to this sort of thing. But like, if you have it, someone like his character, like Dan, could just like use that money and go start his own company or get an education. Like this is what when we yeah. see universal basic income pilot programs, that's what they do. That's what people do. You know, everyone's like, oh, they're just going to spend it on drugs and alcohol. No, so you're you're, you're showing the, the, the truth of the Rorschach trust here, right? Because yes. you're bringing all of this stuff that you <laughs> kind of wanted it to be about, but it's not really yeah. about that. You're and right. th- there, there's no question. Like there was more of an opportunity here to tell something thematically. I wouldn't say it's uninteresting. I don't, I don't think there aren't any themes here, but I think they could have been bolder with those themes. Mm. Um, but they didn't. They chose not to. They chose to have more of a um, traditional Doctor Who story and let us sort of fill in the blanks, you know, gives us enough to sort of play with and get our, uh, not just head canon, like theme canon going, right? Yeah. Like, that's what we're doing. Uh, yeah. Doing I, it. I, so, so be... I give it a lot of points for that. And and it, I, I will say, like, in terms of what it, in showing the reality of work today. Hmm. Uh, I, I like those references, honestly, even better than the references to old Doctor Who episodes. Like the mm. dialogue from the robots themselves is so yeah. good. It's It seems like it's so focus grouped. Like I love their little friendly chastising of people who aren't being productive. Like that mm-hmm. bit where the robot goes behind Dan and Yaz, I think it's like, great conversation guys, but why don't we leave those to our designated breaks? <laughs> you know, like something like that. I just thought that was like, that is dead on what yep. work today is like. Like no, you don't have like foreman yelling, get back to work, but you do have euphemistic, creepy middle managers. Yes. That's like great conversation guys, but let's get this, let's f- refocus. And you know, like yeah. I, they, they could have shed like synergies or something. I guess that's probably dated <laughs> language now, but you know, well, just that the moment. Silliness. It really reminded me of Office Space and yeah. Lumberg, you know, yes, which I feel exactly. really, really nails that type of manager. What's happening? Okay, I'm going to need you to go ahead and come in on Saturday. Okay, like yeah, so so I get it, but I also again like Office Space did that 23 years ago. <laughs> it's uh, true. <laughs> it's kind of well, that's like, what we do. You gotta, know, it's a whole generation yeah. of people who have grown up <laughs> since Office Space came out. They need they need still, uh, their touchstones. 
I get it. I don't want to be the guy who's like, if this was just a completely different story, it would be perfect. Uh, you know, I get it. You, you have to sort of take it on its own terms. You have to understand the limitations of writing. And I, uh, I often go back to, you remember the movie Sliding Doors? Speaking of time travel. Oh, no, I never two, saw it, but I know exactly what you're talking two about. Two parallel right? Gwyneth Paltrow's, right? And it's a rom-com. And uh, I remember watching it with my dad, and my dad was like, oh, well, that's kind of a waste of the concept. Like, I would have seen, wanted to see one version where she becomes prime minister and another version where she becomes, like, a homeless person and, like, contrast those. I'm like, yeah, dad, but it's a rom-com. Uh, you know, take it on its own terms. <laughs> so I, I understand. This is a Doctor Who episode. It's for kids. Like, I don't want deep disquisitions on bullshit jobs and universal basic income. It just, it's another example for me of why I couldn't suspend disbelief. Uh, mm-hmm. And I will give you one more that could have been easily fixed. So we there's there's a cut between, so Graham becomes a maintenance guy. Right. And there's a cut between, yeah. like, he gets rule number one. And and then we cut back to him when we're supposed to remember that he was being given rules. Uh, and it's just a cut to him sort of like falling asleep on his mop. And hmm. and the Kablam robot is saying something like, you know, and remember, don't drink the cleaning fluids. Or what have we learned? Like, don't drink the cleaning fluids. Say, oh, yeah, don't drink. The and for a moment, I'm like, I didn't remember that early scene. And like, I did Graham drink the cleaning fluids? Is that why he's falling asleep on his mop? <laughs> Like just a moment Tired like that, where dude. it's like you're not yeah. really thinking of how the the viewer's brain is going to work going through these scenes. Like I just needed a bit more hand holding. You know what I mean? Yeah, they kind of probably fell in love with their own gags, or felt they needed mm-hmm. to do gags sometimes when they probably should have just got the plot going. I will say, Graham, even though he of all the fam probably has the least to do here, he has, I think, the best line in the whole thing where charlie asks him have you have you smelled her like kira and he's like surprisingly i haven't uh which kind of brought the house down in my household i watched this with my kids and my wife and we all just like it was it was a massive lol moment when he says that so nice uh nice moment there so yeah yeah yeah. I do like Charlie, by the way. I think I think it's it's a nice reveal. It's also a nice reveal because it calls back to the thing of like she's telling Graham like nobody nobody notices the maintenance man and mm-hmm. we don't notice the the second maintenance man who gets to go everywhere and do everything. Like that's that was that was a nice right. twist. I did appreciate that. And they they do exactly and they kind of set it up with that line um and and gives you the sense you probably should have seen it coming it is a good whodunit right because you're all like okay that it's a tight cast which is one of the reasons there's only two executives they wanted to keep the number of characters pretty low and that like someone's got to be the bad guy or it's just the robots Mm -hmm. or something but it's never just the robots right that's one of the things i i do like Mm -hmm. um it's it's kind of a callback there's a callback to robots of death when she makes sort of a reference to quote robophobia uh but though in this context it's really more of a so I think it's sort of setting up that subversion of of the uh, themes by mm. seemingly buying into kind of a microaggression type culture point of view uh, by by using the word uh, like oh you know you're calling them creepy that's just that's robophobic in the same way people use all you know phobic attach phobic to anything these days and meaning you're sort of prejudiced yeah. or something um, yeah but and, yeah, but uh, where was I going with that I was like mm-hmm. the robots of death. Uh, I don't want to spoil that one either, but even though the robots are seemingly, you know, the ones that are, um, never mind. I'll just, I'll just say, leave it at that. It's a, it fuels the who done it. <laughs> well, that something you can, it could be the humans. It could be the robots, but come on. We know it's the humans. <laughs> the robots of death, by the way, uh, one of the, um, uh, probably the, the best, the highest rated Tom Baker story that I haven't seen. So, I'm I'm very excited to to get to that one. When I, we get I, to I, it. Yeah, that's why I wanted to <laughs> stop myself a little <laughs> bit from talking about it. But I do say, like, this is one of the better. Like, again, back to the robot design and the dialogue paired with that, where it's so banal but creepy. Very much robots of death. Different kind of dialogue, different era, different design, but that whole mm. juxtaposition of something that should be mundane is creeping me out. Um, mm. kind of inherent to the idea but it's and kind of easy to do but like definitely reverberations between the two speaking of uh, juxtaposition um, 
What, what did you think of the the ankle bracelets? It seemed a bit of a bit of a heavy handed metaphor for me. Yeah. Okay. That 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 is is probably the high water mark of like pushing the idea we're going to be do some kind of pro worker screed because that's pretty mm. wow. Like I guess you could. <laughs> think about the future where wearable technology is kind of more acceptable. So it's not the thing that like, like in other words, they could believably not react with revulsion, a worker being yes. presented with an ankle bracelet. Um, however, we're reacting with revulsion at home. Like, Holy exactly. crap. Like, that's, and, and there's uh, already, I mean, look, yeah. I'm, I'm voluntarily wearing an Apple watch and I'm voluntarily, voluntarily wearing an right. Ura ring. Like there are the places where I'm just gladly is? slip on another bracelet, <laughs> you know, just don't, don't stick it on my ankle, man. Like, why would you do that? Yeah. Well, what you know, it, unless like, you're trying like to make the, a, a point. Well, I like that from a plot perspective, they forget about it. That that was pretty yes. good and actually kind of believable, like because they put these things mm. on, they kind of forget about them, and they're just like, okay, we're gonna go in there, and then of course they just find them right away. How'd you find us? Ankle bracelet. Oh right, those things we put on like five scenes ago. How is it none of us thought of that? But it's like, yeah, I I, I believe it. I believe you would just kind of like forget about them and just think, ah, damn it. I, uh, yeah, and I, and I would totally believe that the doctor suffers from like buffer overrun, which is basically what's going. She has this good line about like, oh, this this is the problem with a conspiracy. There's too many things to keep in your head at once. I can't remember all of the all of all of the things, and the fact that I'm wearing an ankle bracelet is one. Yeah, so well, I kind of like bracelet. that explanation of it. Yeah. yeah. So, All right. Yeah. It seems like this has left you with a number of questions, though, Chris. Oh, yeah. Uh, lots oh, yes. of them. But we have some questions of our own to answer. And those are, of course, the four questions to Doomsday. First question. Why did the randomizer take us here? I've well, got a lot of theories, uh, but you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I've already uh, mentioned the, the, the sort of the... If you were doing a heavy-handed metaphor on pull to open, you would say that the connection is human sacrifice. Uh, no. because these, these workers are like some of them are literally sacrifi- being sacrificed. Yeah, we were just and, complaining and, about ankle ankle bracelets a minute ago. Like, right. damn. But this is basically what what Kablam itself is doing, right? The the Kablam itself has become sentient, and it like it's killing a worker just to to it's ki- it kills Kira just to show charlie what it feels like right so it's that's a human sacrifice arguably um Mm -hmm. and and also so the connection of human sacrifice ish and the fact that you only see two humans in charge and that can go either way depending on the quality of the script hmm okay that's not bad um i was racking my brain for on the why the randomizer was here and i kind of thought up a bunch of reasons so mm-hmm. first of all i thought like kind of what we said at the beginning even before the commentary like it's tr- we're, we're kind of on this crazy yo-yo of the doctor who timeline of being at the very beginning now almost rocketed right to the very end so that's right. that could be it mm-hmm. um there was the whole comment in the Aztecs about physically separating the doctor and his, her companions from the TARDIS. So yes. they don't have the refuge. And this kind of, Kerblam kind of shows how to do it so super casually, right? It doesn't even have to be part of the story. It's like, we just parked the TARDIS a bit further out. <laughs> so we actually have to walk to this company and then, you know, you can't just go back without like leaving the concert and you can't, you yeah. can't get your hand stamped. So there you go. Right. Like, <laughs> so that's not bad. Uh, and mm. finally, here's here's what I thought it was. I have actually have one more thing after this, but the the bit where the doctor disables Slade with her thumb. Ooh, <laughs> so yes. It's basically, Venusia Nikito is what she's using there, but it is like, oh yeah. So clearly, Ian in the mm-hmm. Aztecs was somehow retroactively taught Venusia Nikito by the doctor at some point. He's like beamed into his. <laughs> brain or something he, he learned the skill ian so had been watching a youtube video on the tardis uh, he, <laughs> he looked at the doctor's browser history he saw a video on venusian aikido there's a search on like how to disable a man with a thumb and there you like, go oh, yeah, i'll watch that five minute video yeah so Fabulous. 
That could be it. Uh, but honestly, I think the, the randomizer this time is less about making connections and more about the zeitgeist. So in other words, sometimes the randomizer just takes mm. us where we need to go. And it all speaks to what I was saying about, you know, this is the age of AI, chat GPTs, taking writer jobs and everything else. Uh, everything's going to be automated. Human work is the question. And the question of what it's going to look like 5, 10, 20 years from now is like it's more relevant than ever. Um, mm. So I don't have a, like a big conclusion there. Mm. I just feel like it, I think the randomizer is trying to sort of get us to think about this and maybe send this podcast to the folks at open AI and yep. get them to ponder it. Yeah. And also we, we can ponder the question of uh, what, what will Dr. Who episodes look like when they're written by AI? Uh, will, will the AI be able to better overcome these, uh, these questions that the viewer has in their minds? Uh, looking forward to that. Um, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I, I like it when the randomizer does does random stuff like that and r- rockets us from one end of the Doctor's timeline to another. Now now watch it take us from an unearthly child to power of the Doctor, neither of which we've done. Oh, man. Yeah, I'm down. I'm down. <laughs> okay, well, something else went down here, uh, but the, uh, the bad guys did not win, but we like to wonder, what if they did? And what if the evil plot had succeeded? So this okay. obviously means Charlie's, so Charlie's robots, yeah. they all go, mm-hmm. the Kerblam men make their deliveries, everyone pops the stuff, the the bubble wrap, and there's mass murder throughout the galaxy. Um, Kerblam is implicated. Right. Presumably the company gets shut down or, you know, there's trials, blah, 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 whatever. Um, what happens? So if, those, yeah. so if Kerblam well, goes away, I feel like now there are no jobs. So, so first of all, we we have to question how many people are are killed in this uh, by by this situation. Because yes, we do see an army. By the way, this is one of my issues with the episode: is like the when you see this army of post robots out in front of you, and Graham says it looks like an army, uh, and that is that is breaking one of one of the rules of television that that I learned at uh, in broadcast class at journalism school was. Uh, don't do a sea dog say dog, which is what they called it. Like, don't <laughs> don't say dog if you're seeing a dog. We can see it's a dog. Like yeah. yes, Graham, we can Show see it's tell. an army. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, you know, but also, was it that big of an army? Really? Like it, it well, didn't it's not really... an army. What it is, it's it's hmm. a terrorist incident. Which is to say, right. if you have ten thousand robots or whatever it is go out to 10,000 homes, presumably all throughout the galaxy, they all blow up. This becomes a massive story. Um, so they're not conquering anything. They're just making Kerblam look really, really bad. Or, or are they making themselves look really, really bad? Uh, <laughs> you know, this is kind of mean? like, well, you know, the, uh, are people really going to blame Kerblam for this? Or is perhaps the truth going to come out that this was a terror cell? And actually, it's a war on terror, and the you know that the, the planet that Kablam is in orbit around becomes this you know super hyper militaristic state that just goes after the terrorists and uses them as a scapegoat. Hmm. Interesting. So it doesn't work, is what you're saying. Yeah. His plan basically cements Kablam, and I'm, just I'm saying, yeah, society. exactly. It's a 9/11 kind of situation where okay. the 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 response to the terrorist act vast vastly outweighs the terrorist act itself, right? And everyone's suddenly, you know, no one was sitting around after nine eleven going, you know, Bin Laden's got a point. Yeah, I mean, maybe n- neither one happens because I was sort of thinking like Kerblam goes out of business. Um, you're thinking sort of new regime based on the incident, but you think about mm-hmm. Charlie, right? So Charlie's like this kid essentially, and it, it seems like he's deliberately cast young and sort of like clearly portrayed to be this naive person who spent too much time yeah. online and don't, don't uh, he has a line like we're, politics we're the generation that gets things done or something like that that felt like a very sort of uh knock on gen z kind of moment yeah which i think you know um i think yeah i think that's exactly what they were kind of trying to do with him i don't think there's a lot of headcanon you got to bring to that to, to sort of have that read so 
but I think from a plot standpoint, it seems pretty clear he's not part of a larger organization and that mm-hmm. there's some kind of, you know, anti Kerblam force, uh, <laughs> the implosion force, you might call them, <laughs> yeah. uh, out in the galaxy ready to take over once Kerblam uh, falls or something. So maybe he it just becomes this sad had. thing. Maybe it just becomes like, oh, this was a really terrible incident and you know just weighs heavily on people but it doesn't really have a lasting effect because charlie's just not a revolutionary yeah but this is um like unless unless you believe that charlie is inserting the gas into every uh every bubble wrap bubble then well, not i feel personally. like not personally, but then like how he can't have just done this by himself. And if he did do it by himself so easily, then this is an argument to get rid of the 10% of human workers, right? Mm. Because look at the damage one guy could cause. One, you know, robots wouldn't have done that. Robots tried to fix it. Let's get rid right. of this 10% law. You Interesting. Uh, so it's yeah. like Judy and Slade are fired. Yep. <laughs> for their incompetence here and this happened right under their noses yep her blam basically becomes a hundred percent robot or 100 percent automated yeah. and there's even fewer jobs yeah but everyone has two minutes shipping f- so i mean <laughs> well here's another thing i i think they would have to change the name of the company oh yeah because uh, it would just be too like if this disaster happens oh, yeah. of course uh, thousands yeah. of people get exploded uh, all around the galaxy. Yeah, no, you're gonna. Yeah, just just change it to X. Oh, there you go. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Like, that does seem to be what we're learning from tech companies. Is you know, in trouble, change your name, change right? It to Meta or Alphabet or yeah, Meta X. <laughs> so, okay. so yeah. lots of possibilities there. Do, do you like any possibility in particular? I I do think yeah, definitely change the name. I like the yeah. idea that it just that not not a lot happens other than that. That things just kind of go on, and the the robots, yeah, it becomes more robotic. I like the last one we came up. With. Yeah, yeah, that it just they get rid of this ten percent law instead of Charlie saying, "Oh, this is the thin end of the wedge; they're going to cut it down." Ten percent wasn't enough. That they they just go in the opposite direction and like, you know, it's going to be safer for humanity everywhere if we just completely automate. Hmm. And yeah. eventually, they just start selling oxygen to people. Hey, hey, there we go. Nicely connected. All right. Well, that leads us to our third question, which is where is the Clara Splinter? Clara Oswald, of course, splintered in time at the end of the name of the Doctor. She is somewhere in every single Doctor Who story. What is she doing in Kerblam? Uh, well, last week we suggested that she was, uh, she was the one responsible for Montezuma's, uh, weird non-appearance in the Aztecs, uh, that she's like, uh, Montezuma's, uh, wife and just taking him on vacation or something. Maybe the Mm. same is happening here with space Jeff Bezos, whoever that is. She's, uh, she's taking him or her away out of the action, (laughs) away from the factory uh, just so that the, the doctor can investigate more easily, and you know she's making sure that uh, more of the management is in ha- the hands of these two incompetent human. Chris, managers. Chris, you have to stop pimping Clara out, okay? <laughs> <laughs> this is the last time. Look, uh, she, she space Jeff Bezos may be an awesome guy who yeah. Clara actually you know fall, falls in love with, and they go to the singing tower. Got really and, swole. <laughs> <Later in life. laughs> so okay that could be it well, I think yes, there's any his head number, her. Th- there's any number of like the questions that you brought up i think she could fill in one of the things that again for me is a real head scratcher is and it's anyone would have designed the kerblam hq or, or sorry the kerblam factory such that the delivery bay is inaccessible yeah. to humans like they literally can't physically get in um so maybe that was like her idea <laughs> and maybe she's she's some kind of logistics person who convinced Kerblam this is the way to do it and uh or i don't know well, maybe she she designed the uh 
the conveyor belt system to match yes. the the droid factory in in attack of the clones, <laughs> attack you know, of the like clones. Yes, one I of those. Well. <laughs> or maybe she's she's done it to match the uh, as close as she can to whatever Ryan's warehouse that he was working in, because that's something else that didn't right. really land for me. Like Ryan is, has this coordination problem, we know that, but he's still just he's the one who suggests it, just like jumping in onto that uh, onto the whole conveyor belt system. You'd think he would be. Like he would have much more resistance to that notion. Um, mm. So maybe well, I think it's okay because that, that sort of speaks to his bravery. Mm. But hey, anyway, what were we going to say? What is she? I was going to say that that maybe she has desire. She desire. She's not here at all, but she's in the factory that Ryan worked in, uh, designing that delivery system to look as much like this, so that he won't actually die when he jumps off from one conveyor belt to the other mm. uh, because he's it's, it's like muscle memory kicks in like i don't know right. how exactly that would work but like you know that whole conveyor belt scene definitely just seemed a might too convenient to me yeah and it's also like i don't know it, they're trying to do this attack of the clones thing but i it's very not memorable like if someone yeah. falls and of course they land on another thing there's there's nothing new or original here we've seen this a million yeah. times and i get there's a there's a barrier, uh, uh, not a barrier. You have to put a barrier in front of your your people, and you, and then you need some excitement for pacing. I just think you know they could have they could have iterated a bit here and done a little better. Okay, mm-hmm. so that's the third question. Uh, coming up to the final question, the ultimate question, the only question that matters for Kerblam. What did we think of this story? The Polta Open Rating System has six ratings. There is the Dalek, which we give to a good episode of Doctor Who. The Ogron, which we give to a not-so-good episode of Doctor Who. The Professor Hater, which we give to a not-so-great episode of Doctor Who, but hey, at least they tried something, or at least we learned something. The Viscount Banger, which we give to the best of the best. The fixed point in time, which of course is for episodes, we are we can't rate. They're beyond rating. They can't be rated for sometimes for reasons of nostalgia, but occasionally for other reasons. And finally, the Lady Cassandra, which we give to Doctor Who that looks good, but maybe isn't good. So you might want to just leave it on at a party with the sound off. <laughs> What's yeah. this one in your book, Chris? Come on, let me have it. Well, I was, for a while, I was thinking Lady Cassandra, and I was thinking, you know, this is kind of going to be a common rating in the in the Chibnall <laughs> era, because Doctor Who, like, it, it's so ironic that, that the budgets have, have just shot up, uh, you know, after, you know, RTD might, could have made such good use of them in, in his first term in office and, and Moffat could have been like the budgets have been steadily rising for Doctor Who. It looks better and better. Like all of the Whitaker era looks amazing. The, the interior yeah. of the TARDIS, era, you know, yeah. the hexagon scanners. I, I love it all. I, I, I liked a lot about how this worked, but, uh, but is it, is, is the factory really that sort of lady Cassandra? Is it, is it that pretty? Um, I, I don't think so. So I am going for the, alternate rating don't want to give it an ogre on i think they did at least try something so it's a hater for me a hater kind of saw that going it's a hater <laughs> yeah <laughs> see i disagree i think it's a good episode of dr Who. it is very it's a very shiny and competent dalek this dalek really yeah. knows how to exterminate uh it's doing well okay maybe if he works at it a little more and <laughs> you know gets a little more focus in what he's doing he might even become one of those commander daleks or perhaps the supreme yeah so yeah this, this coming, dalek's got this dalek's got upper management written all over it you know if this dalek will just come in on on saturday do a few extra hours i think uh i think it, it's got a good career ahead of it yeah I think so too. Not quite epic, epic enough to be a banger, but I actually thought about maybe a banger on this one. But it's just it's not not quite enough there there for both story and theme. But getting there, guys. Before we cut to our own TARDIS and escape, I want to remind all Spotify listeners: you can also rate Kerblam. Just go ahead into the poll feature on your app, and it is time for you to tell. The world of Pull to Open, what you thought of this story. Is it a Viscount banger? Is it a Dalek? 
Is it a hater? Maybe you think it's a Lady Cassandra for those glowing robot eyes alone. Go ahead, let us know, <laughs> and we will report those findings in a future episode of Pulse Open. That's right. And in the meantime, we, we must away. We must teleport back conveniently to our TARDIS where there is some bubble wrap on the floor. What are we going to do about that? Like, uh, by the way, that was another thing, like just leaving it with them looking at the bubble wrap and the packaging at the very end. Like, okay. <laughs> and what what is the result of this? You want kids to be afraid to pop bubble wrap? Uh, sure. I, I you know, yeah. why not? <laughs> All right. You know, the good thing about Tear this is the like wrap doc- on the playground. Doctor Don't Who has been that using Amazon package, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor Who has been using bubble wrap since at least 1970, right? In the costumes, right? The and space, and yep. this is the this is the first time that you're thinking of uh, you know uh, bubble wrap itself being being the um, you know the the plot driver. I don't know. Uh, it feels like we should have thought of that earlier if you're going to do it. <laughs> feels a bit bottom of the barrel esque in terms of villains. I don't know. Maybe that's See, just me. I don't know. I know we're feels... supposed to stop talking about this show episode, but I, I like <laughs> that you didn't. It, it was actually genuinely surprising that, that the bubble wrap was the thing. And I think yeah. it's because you don't quite know the stakes, the full stakes of this. You know, people are missing, but like the mass murder plot kind of mm. comes fast and furious. So there's this escalation of stakes at the end that I still think works. But because you don't have a lot of time to think about it, you're not thinking about the bubble wrap. And when it's revealed, it's actually like, oh, mm. so I, I found that very satisfying. The Graham thing at the end. eh? I mean, that's just your <laughs> it's trying to do the final horror movie scare or something, but it's kind of ends right. up being whatever. But I don't know. That's sort of something a lot of the episodes of this era seem to do. Um, so some of them land, some of them don't. I'm not. It's, I'm I, not I don't know. It sort of feels like if if you can have a scene where at the the end of the end of the story, the the monster or the thing you're supposed to be scared of is in the TARDIS, then that's you don't just cut away from that. Or if you do just cut away from that, maybe it wasn't a big deal in the first place. Yeah, um, well, that's, that's, that's kind that's of like you know. There's there's like there's so much you can do to make bubble wrap scary, and they they maxed out in the Ark in space for sure. So yeah. It's as if you you end blink with like oh crap there's there's a statue in the TARDIS. <laughs> Is oh. it just a statue? We don't know. Uh, like you'd want to know more at that point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You'd be a bit kind of worried for for the Doctor. And uh, all right, yeah. folks, now, and now we're really done strange. talking yes, right. about Kerblam. Definitely done. <laughs> Sorry, I said and it wrong. In fact, now we're really done talking about Kerblam. Kerblam. That's all uh, you have to all say. right. Yes, it, it feels like we we should do an Emerald Legacy kind of uh, kablam kind of uh, stop version. us oh, stop us from saying kablam by getting us into our own time ship and activating the yes. randomizer. The randomizer has two components. Pete has one. It's called the Codex. It's the complete list of all of Doctor Who stories in sequential order. And uh, Pete also has the magic number of how many stories we still have to do. Pete, what is the magic number this week? The magic number is 206. 206? Oh my god, just last week it was 207. That's amazing. <laughs> um, it seems like just a week ago it's 207. All right, so I plug that into random.org, which is the other part of the randomizer. It is the executor. It uses true randomness from atmospheric noise, atoms, and kablam men bouncing around the atmosphere waiting to deliver packages and uh, infers randomness from their random behavior rather than algorithms, which is uh, a bullshit version of randomness. I'll just go ahead and say it. Uh, It's just guessing at it. Uh, You know, maybe human jobs in the future that uh, machines can still not do will include coming up with random numbers because that's something we can do better than machines. Uh, but we do like to uh, genuflect before the randomizer, uh, perhaps even kowtow before it, and um, give it some challenges. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to go ahead with a challenge this week, because I okay. just thought of it, which is give us more bubble wrap. I'm gonna, oh, <laughs> I'm gonna risk, wow. I'm going to risk some classic who here, but like, give us a monster with bubble wrap. Or something. Interesting. Somewhere in the episode. 
Well, before I give my challenge, I want to give a voice to someone who is going to be with us next week for the oh, commentary yes. on this uh, show we're about to reveal. And uh, we're going to have a guest with us, all things being <laughs> all, all stars aligning properly, all deliveries made on right. time. Um, and our guest uh, has, has made his own request. So, Ooh. Uh, should I say who the guest is? Is it, will people know? Sure. At this point? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Come on, the guest is going on. to be Mark Cochran from the All of Time and Space podcast. So he's going to join hey, us for this yeah. commentary, and he has requested Oh Mighty Randomizer, something from Matt Smith, Peter Capaldi, your favorite Doctor Randomizer, or <laughs> season seventeen. Interesting choice, Ooh. which I believe is the key to time season. Okay, right? all right, all right. interesting. That's cool. Oh, key to time. Sure, sure there's some bubble wrap somewhere in the key to time. Uh, mm. You know, sure we see the, so, the Black Guardian at one point just popping. No, um, yeah, yeah. So to to allow for maybe all of these things, bubble wrap, those particular eras, <laughs> um, and something in Doctor Who, I'm just going to say like you know this was sort of sort of a political episode, mm. and I'm just like you know go all the way with that randomizer let's yep. like get political with it like what let's let's get some some intrigue let's get some themes uh, i'll even take some messaging and it could be counter program messaging or whatever but what's the most political episode of doctor who you could possibly take us to let's have it interesting i i would definitely is is uh, robots of death in the key to time series it's not is it no no robots of death is well before yeah it's, right uh, right at least because uh, like that that would be the time medalist slash aztecs thing to do here right we've, we've oh, talked yeah. so much about the contrast uh True. and i'd love to see it so uh bring that on if you must i'll i'll forego my bubble wrap request but anyway give me a countdown let's see where we're going next let's do it in four three two one whoa nelly 73. 73. It's old. Here we go. We are at Megalos. Oh, wait. Megalos. Exclamation point. Megalos. Megalos. <laughs> Meg okay, we're going to add an exclamation point. Let me tell you about that. Is, we're just gonna you know, do they that. should have. Yes. This should have been an exclamation point. <laughs> come to so we, get, we went from the one exclamation point title to the one of the classic series that most deserves an exclamation point. There's yes. your connection randomizer. Wow, Meglos the musical. Oh, we we just missed season seventeen. I just realized now. Of course, season wow. seventeen isn't. Sorry, it's not the key to time season. I, I misremembered. Season seventeen is the Douglas Adams as yes. script editor season. We started with Destiny of the Daleks, so we just missed season seventeen. So hopefully, <sighs> Mark, this is close enough. Hopefully, this this hits tickles your season seventeen uh, itch uh, I, I a little know bit. What? You know what, Pete? You know what's kind of like bubble wrap? A oh, cactus. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going to pop the bubble wrap. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. We're going to pop some bubble wrap on Tom Baker's face, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, man. Seriously. <laughs> this is amazing. It's, it's, it's bubble wrap with things coming out of it. That's what we got oh going my on here. God, I I remember. So this was one of the ones that I watched early early in my fandom, and I remember not understanding the difference between this and the Ledger Hive. <laughs> right, I could <laughs> really remember <laughs> where one ended and one the other one began. Right, it just felt like very much the same story. Uh, like the doctor, doctor gets old. The doctor turns into a cactus. Uh, not even sure what's happening here. And there are weird planets in both with strange names. So Ooh. we're going to get all to that, folks, next week with our special guest, Mark Cockrum from the Ball Time and All of Time and Space podcast. So thank you, listener, for listening to this podcast. Pull to open. It's a podcast. Why don't you give it a follow if you haven't already? Uh, if you're listening on YouTube slash watching on YouTube, go ahead, give us a subscribe. That would really help. And if you want notifications for whenever we have new content, I'm sure there's a bell icon or something. Go ahead and hit that. And of course, don't forget to like the video, like and subscribe. That's what you do, right? Hey, guys, we are also on the socials. We are on Twitter, Instagram, threads, and Facebook at pull to open 63 We're at TikTok and Blue Sky at Blue Sky. pull to open I want to thank Martin West for his great music. As always, we're really excited to get uh, to Megloss next week. 
and perhaps prick open that episode hey. and uh, get all that juicy Doctor Who goodness inside. We are going to worship not just the randomizer, but also a dodecahedron. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're gonna, I'm going to be able to pull out my, uh, my season 18 scarf here. Uh, the, oh, the, the, yeah. My favorite Baker scarf. I'll be back to that. I'll be oh. wearing that just as I was for, for full circle. So looking back to going full circle to season 18 next week. Join us for that. It'll be a ton of fun. See you then, guys. See you soon. <laughs>